our services this morning. We're glad you're able to be here and if you're visiting with us. We're especially glad you're with us and like to invite you to be with us anytime you have the opportunity. First song this morning is going to be number 501. Number 501. So, oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, the brilliant in splendor. Heavenly Father, our Creator and our Redeemer, Father, we do thank you for this Lord's Day that you've given us the breath of life and the measure of health that we can gather together here this morning with those of like faith to worship you in spirit and in truth, we do pray. Father, be with each one that's here this morning that we will worship you in spirit and in truth and be pleased in your sight. Father, we know that we often fall short of what you would have us to do and have us to be, and we just ask you to forgive us, and we thank you for that continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus as we walk in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship one with another. Be with us as we go to classes this morning, be with the teachers, give them a good recollection of things they've studied, and Teach them in a way that we as students can hear and understand them, and if we find them to be the truth, to live them out in our daily lives. Father, we have those that are, are sick and our families and our loved ones and our, our family here at Ephesus. To, we just pray your richest blessings on them, if it be your will. May their health be restored. Comfort those, Father, that have lost loved ones recently and help us to be a comfort in any way that we can. 
continue with us now and throughout this worship on through future life. When we come to the end of the life way, give us a home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is amazing how much better these things work when they have batteries that have juice in them. I noticed Wednesday night that it was turning red and I didn't change it out. I should have then. We are studying in the book of Hebrews. We are in chapter 13 and we appreciate your being here. We do have visitors and I'm sorry that I do not have any extra workbooks at this time. I'm going to try to get some and I keep forgetting to do that. Appreciate those that join us online as well. Uh, as you know, I was out last week, and Joel talked for me, and I appreciate it, and appreciate the good job he did. In chapter 13, which is the last chapter of the book of Hebrews, as we've pointed out earlier, and as he pointed out last week, it's, it's really a, a, a chapter that's just practical, everyday things that have to do with living. It talks about personal living, and he talked about the immorality and so on and being content and that kind of thing. And then he talks about, from a spiritual standpoint, also uh, some application things that need to be done. We're ready for question number nine on page 30, which is taken from uh, verse 11. Uh, and we really need to back up a little bit if we're going to get the sense of it. Uh, beginning verse nine, he says, do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings for it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought in the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Hence let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we're seeking the city which is to come. Through him then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that gives thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let him do this with joy, not with grief, for this will be unprofitable for you. So he's drawing on really what the whole book has been dealing with, and that is a, a contrast of the old law and the law of Christ. And 
all of the sacrifices and so on under the Old Testament covenant uh, that the priest made and, and the animals that were offered up and so on. And under the law of Christ, Jesus is the sacrifice uh, and he is the one who is offered up for our sins. And so he's again comparing that. And of course, it's been a comparison showing the superiority of, of Christ throughout the book of Hebrews, uh, his superiority to the angels, his superiority to Moses, uh, his superiority as a offering, his superiority as a priest, his superiority uh, as, as an intercessor. Uh, and, and so a lot of different ways Christ is superior to everything they had under the law of Moses. And so this is just sort of a summary of that uh, as, as he goes into it. And so the question number nine, the animals offered as sacrifices whose blood was brought into the tabernacle had their bodies blank outside the camp, had their bodies burned. Okay. One of the things that sort of I think probably a little difficult for us to understand is the laws that were such a big part of the Old Testament law that dealt with cleanliness and uncleanliness. Not physically clean or unclean, but ceremonially, religiously clean and unclean. And we don't think a lot about that uh, today in, in the way that they had to then. And there were just so many different things that they could touch or do or, or whatever that rendered them unclean, in which case, depending on what it was, they would not be able to maybe go even go home uh, and be with their family. Or it may be they couldn't meet in an assembly where they were meeting with other people or they couldn't uh, do various other things. And they would very often have to be cleansed and or usually had to be cleansed in one way or another. And it might mean a sacrifice. It might mean a washing or it might be both. Uh, it might mean appearing before the priest and the priest doing things. So there was a number of different things that rendered them clean and unclean. One of those was touching or coming in contact with a dead body. And it didn't matter whether it was an animal or a person. It still, you became unclean if you came in contact with a dead body. And so it was a part of the job of the priest when they offered up sacrifices, all the remaining part of the carcass that was not used as part of that sacrifice was taken outside the city and burned. And so they would get rid of it in that way. Uh, and that's, that's what this is referring to uh, here. So it says, Jesus also, that he might blank the people with his own blank, suffered outside the gate. Jesus, that he might sanctify the people by his own blood suffered outside the gate. Now, in what sense did Jesus suffer outside the gate? Any idea? Where, where was Golgotha? Is outside the city, yeah. It was a hill that was outside the city, and so Jesus was crucified outside the city gate. And so, you know, you don't think about that as you read the story, but it actually is a part of the, the type of being a sacrifice as under the old law and so on. Uh, and, and so he, he brings that out here, and so it's one of those sort of little things that we don't think a lot about, and yet it, it does have significance to it. Um, and so he was sacrificed outside the gate, and, and then he says, the next verse, verse 13, we should go forth to him outside the camp, blank his blank. We should go to, to him outside the camp doing what? Bearing his reproach. In other words, we identify with him. He's saying you draw close to God through Jesus Christ and you identify with him in his sacrifice. And when we become a Christian, we identify with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When we are baptized into Christ, we're buried in baptism, raised, Paul says, to walk in newness of life. Just like Jesus died and was buried and became a new person to live forever. And so... We, we have these various types of things that are shown to us, and, and it helps us understand better the spiritual aspect of it, I think, 
but he says we identify with him outside the camp. We go to him is what we do. All right, he says, so let us continue to offer the sacrifice of blank to God, that is the fruit of our blank, giving blank, blank. Okay, let us continue to offer the sacrifice of praise to God. And he says the, our praise to God in the sacrifice that we make is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Okay, so since we are... We have our sins forgiven through Jesus Christ and we identify with him. Then he says that we offer up praise to him. And that should be just a natural reaction. It should be that if we're a Christian, praise to God should be just a natural reaction to or response to our having our sins forgiven. I mean, there's, there's nothing greater we could receive than that. And so we, we should be willing to praise Him, and we should want to praise Him. Uh, and the fruit of our lips, I think, what does that mean? How do we praise God as the fruit of our lips? Praise Him. Okay, singing would be one way. And we sing a lot of songs of praise. There's a, there's a lot of the songs that we sing regularly. There are songs that praise God. There are songs that praise Jesus Christ. And so singing would certainly be a part of that. What else? Okay. I think what we say and how we say it, when we say it, all of that has a part of, of our praise to God. He says praising Him, giving thanks to His name. And sometimes we might not think about giving thanks as praising God, but it is. Because it's a recognition of who he is and recognition of his, his uh, superiority over us. And so we give thanks, and that's praising his name. So it may be in the things we say. It may be in the, the, the things we sing, uh, various ways that we might praise him. And I think all of that would be included in it. And then he says, remember to do blank and to blank. Remember to do good and to... Share. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he, he asked the question uh, just out of curiosity. How did the local butcher get the blood off of his hands? Uh, number one, Dw uh, Dw uh, Tommy, I'm not sure that in the Jewish culture, well, I started to say that they even had local butchers, but they did because Paul talks about the Corinthians going to the market to buy meat and so on. So scratch that. I was wrong. We'll start over. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, if they followed the law, they would have to go through a ceremonial cleansing every time, you know, probably every day after they'd offered up, after they'd killed these animals. Uh, I'm not really sure. I never really thought about it. Uh, well, it yeah, it had to happen. And, and I, I would have thought, and this is what I started to say to begin with, they probably didn't have local butchers because each family raised their own and they probably slaughtered their own and, and so on. It would be a part of it. And I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, it could be a family member, whoever butchered the animals for, for eating them and so on. Well, I don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and look at the law specifically because I, I feel sure, and I don't remember what it says in regard to that, but I feel sure there's something specifically mentioned when you're killing animals for food or whatever, what you do and how you do it. Uh, do what? Yeah, they, and they, they were told to eat them, so we know that they did. But I, I'd have to just go back and look and see exactly what it tells them to do. I'm sure there was some specific law that dealt with that but I, I don't know what it was off the top of my head it's a good question though uh, all right number 13 we just did remember to do good and to share uh, do you remember what Paul says 
in the book of Galatians in chapter 6 and verse 10. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. As Christians, we should be looking for opportunities to do good for other people. Uh, I, I was with some people yesterday and was talking about a particular lady who was not present, and we were saying good things about her. There was nothing negative said about it. But one of the comments that was made about this particular lady was that she does something good for somebody every day, somebody outside of herself, and she makes sure that she does something good for somebody every day. And I thought, and she's in her 80s. Yeah, she's in her 80s. Uh, so, you know, she's not just a, a young spry chicken out here, you know, with a lot of vim and vigor. Well, she's got a lot of vim and vigor to be 80 years old. But uh, the fact is, she really is making an effort to try to do good and to share and to use what God has given her. And so she actually looks for opportunities to do good for other people. And I'm afraid that too often what we do is we look for opportunities for ourselves to have fun or to do what we want to do or to accomplish what we want to accomplish without regard for helping others or doing good for others. Now, if something slaps us in the face where it's so obvious we can't ignore it, then we say, oh, yeah, I need to do something, and we try to do something to help them. But it's easy for us to get caught up in our own world and not really think about other people and think about what can we do to help them. And, and when you talk about doing good, and it says to share, uh, and, and Paul says, you know, we're to work with our own hands so that we have stuff to be able to share with others. And so, you know, we need to, to be willing to use what God has given us to help other people as well. It's not to be just used on just us and, and just on ourselves. And uh, so it's, uh, it has to be a, a whole way of thinking that says, I'm going to look for opportunities to try to be able to do good and to share with somebody. Yes? Yeah. 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 To help a person's self worth, sometimes all it takes is just saying hello to them. I, I read not too long ago about a, a, a homeless guy who was living on the street, and somebody asked him, you know, what is it that, that you would like most of all if somebody's going to do something? He said, just acknowledge that I exist. You know, it's just, just sometimes just a simple smile or a hello. Uh, I, I remember very well, this was many years ago uh, here at Ephesus, that there was a a young boy who was here at Ephesus and he was in town and one of the older men from here at Ephesus was coming out the door so this young boy opened the door and held it for him and the older guy didn't even acknowledge that the little boy existed or that he knew him or say thank you or anything else and it really hurt that guy's feelings the kid's feelings because he felt like you know he should have Number one, he should have recognized me and known who I was. Number two, he should have at least said, if he didn't know me, say thank you for opening the door. You know, or at least he could have said, hi, how are you, or something. You know, uh, but he didn't do anything. And, and that kind of stuff does make a difference. And so a lot of times, helping and sharing is not you know, giving somebody $1,000. It may be just saying thank you, or hi, how are you or something else, and it may be that it is helping them financially, or it may be that we, they need somebody to help them, you know, do some work around the house. There's a, a lady here in town who has uh, two or three kids, and uh, each, each summer while the kids are out of school, uh, she will generally try to find somebody either who is a needy type family or somebody that is maybe a widow lady or somebody like that that 
needs some work done around the house, and so she takes her kids, and they've painted houses, they've cleaned houses out, they've done all kinds of stuff for other people. Uh, and she said, you know, I'm trying to teach my children that life is not just about them. They need to use their energies to help other people as well. And I think that's wonderful. That's the kind of thing we need to do, Vern. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, if it's at Walmart or where it is, if you if you just speak to people a lot of times it makes a big difference and, and people appreciate that. Uh, they like to know that you exist. Uh, when we went to New York, Diane was really brave. She even spoke to people on the sidewalk in New York. <laughs> She didn't just stop, speak to them. She'd stop them and talk to them. That's, uh, and amazingly, just about everybody we met up there was extremely nice and friendly and, and very helpful to us. Anyway, that's another whole story, but I just thought I'd mention that. Uh, number 14 comes from verse 17. Blank those who rule over you and be blank, for they watch out for your blank. First blank is... Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls. Okay. As you look at this in uh, verse 17, if you back up to verse 7, I know uh, that Joel mentioned this last week, where he says to remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and considering the outcome of their way of life, Imitate their faith. And I'm not so sure that the one in verse 7 is not broader than the elders of a local congregation. I think it probably implies the ones that had taught them the gospel uh, in the first place. Now, that might be a man who was an elder or it might not be. For example, Paul or Timothy or a number of others that were not elders uh, had taught the gospel. Apollos and some others uh, had taught the gospel to a lot of people. And, and so they... He, he's saying you look to them and you imitate them and you imitate their faith uh, because they not only taught you the gospel, but they're showing you how to live the gospel. Now, I think it would include the elders in that, that one as well. This one, I think, is specifically talking about the elders of a local congregation. And he says obey those that have rule over you uh, and be submissive to them because they're watching out for your souls. And he goes on and says... Let them do this with joy, not with grief. Uh, well, first of all, watch out for their souls as those who will give an account. Let them do it with joy, not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. So as, as elders, there is a responsibility for the souls of the people within the church, which means that as elders, there is a responsibility to know what's going on with the people in a local church uh, and, and to know what kind of things they're facing and to know if they're struggling and to know if they are becoming unfaithful or if they're uh, maybe hurting in some area or something else. And that's not easy to do uh, because a lot of times the elders are some of the last people to find out <laughs> about some of these things. Uh, and yet, if we're going to do the job of an elder, then we have to be able to try to at least do our best to keep up with what's going on among the, the people in the church. And so he says, follow their rule. Now then, as an elder, there are always going to be difficult decisions that have to be made. And I don't know of any better example of this than a few years ago when COVID hit and there were elders all over the country that were lambasted for their decisions and it would not have made any difference whether they had decided this or this or this or this there would have they would have still been lambasted because there were so many people that felt so strongly so many different ways and so whatever the decision was there were going to people be people didn't like that decision and and so sometimes and that probably was amplified more than the day-to-day -day affairs of the elders, but it, it points out the difficulty and, and the, 
the emotional strain there is on the elders to try to do what's best for the church and try to decide and knowing when they make the decision that there's going to be some people that's not going to be happy with it and that sometimes has to be done and uh it's just like you know as, as parents we all made decisions for our kids that we knew when we made the decision they weren't going to like it but we knew this is what they needed to do and this is what was best for them and we made that decision and did that and sometimes most of the time we usually were probably right but sometimes we made the wrong decision and same thing's going to be true with elders but he says work with them be submissive to them uh There are, and I've seen this a lot of different places, where you have somebody in the congregation that pretty much whatever the elders decide, they don't like it. And they're going to gripe and complain about it. Uh, it doesn't make any difference if they went this way or this way. They're going to gripe and complain about what the decision that was made. And we don't need to be like that. We need to be supportive. And, and we can support them in their decisions, even if we don't always agree with their decision it, it's sort of like a, and this is not elders but it's a, it, I think it illustrates the point uh, I've heard a story about a, a small congregation that had a big oak tree out front and they had a, a they didn't have elders so they had a business meeting and they discussed the possibility of cutting down the oak tree well there was one man who was adamantly against cutting down that tree but the rest of the people there felt like it needed to be cut down for several different good reasons. And so they decided they were going to cut the tree down. Well, when they got there on the designated day to cut the tree, this guy who had opposed it so vehemently was the first one to show up with his chainsaw. And so somebody asked him, said, man, I thought you didn't want to cut this tree down. He said, I didn't, but we decided we were going to cut it. Well, that was the decision of the church. And he said, we're going to do what been decided and that's the way it needs to be when elders make a decision unless it's something that is just that you cannot conscientiously go along with because you feel it's unscriptural then that should be our attitude it says okay we're going to go along because this is a decision that's been made and we're going to support that decision now obviously if it's something we think is unscriptural we need to go talk to the elders about it and, and try to resolve it but uh, that's that's very 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 few and far between so that's not a big issue probably but uh as far as happening any with any frequency so we need to we need to support them the elders have a very big responsibility the church has a big responsibility in supporting the elders so so it's both ways and and it's because the elders have to give an account for they're watching out for the souls of the people uh now what does it mean to in the latter part of that verse, he says, let them do it with joy and not with, with grief, for this will be unprofitable to you. What is he talking about there? Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, if... if, if if a person is not living right, then that certainly doesn't bring joy. But I'm not sure that's what this sentence is talking about so much. I agree with that, but I'm not sure that that's what this sentence is saying. I think it's talking about being submissive and supporting them in their work is, is what I think it's talking about. If, if, you have, if an elder has to spend a, a big percentage of his time arguing com with people that have complaints and disagreements and, and trying to create problems over the decisions they made it's going to make their job a whole lot more difficult but if they can plan and organize and design and and work within a congregation to make things happen the way it's supposed to happen and people support that it makes their job a lot easier yes Right. Yeah. We all need to be working together for a common cause, and that common cause is for the Lord. Yeah. Uh, unity goes a long way on you know, efficiency and everything else. Well, it, it does, does in, in any organization, organization, but 
and, but especially in the Lord's church, and that's something that God really emphasizes all the way through all the New Testament is unity among His people and working together in, in harmony. Uh, and so, the so yes, I think that that's uh, like I said. I would disagree with what Dwight said. I think that that is very true as far as the what he's saying. It's just that particular sentence I thought maybe a little bit. All right, thought question is. I thought that was sort of didn't require much thought. Is this talking about our president or about our elders? This specific situation is talking about elders. Yeah, it's talking about elders, yes. Uh, now, then should we be submissive to the president? Yes. Yeah, Romans 13 talks about being submissive to the government authorities and so on. And that God put them there. We rebel against the government authorities and we're rebelling against God who put them there. So, yes, we do have responsibility. But this passage has nothing to do with civil authorities at all, whether it's the president or the governor or legislators or mayor or city council or county commission or whoever it is. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with that. This is because it says they watch out for your souls. This is a spiritual leader. This is, so, it's referring, I believe, to you. For what reason did the author especially urge or beseech the Hebrews to pray for him? Okay. Verse 18 and 19, he says, Pray for us, uh, for we're sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things, and I urge you all the more to do this, that I may be restored to you soon. I have no idea what the context of that statement is, other than it implies they were separated and he was hoping to be able to join them soon. Uh, and, you know, since we don't know really who wrote the book, we don't, we don't have any way of trying to even figure out, uh, as far as I know, the context of this statement. Uh, it does, though, I believe, show us the importance of prayer. Uh, we, we need to be a praying people. We need to pray for each other. Uh, and that's one of the things James says, you know, when he talks about confessing your faults one to another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. He says, if a man is sick, let him call for the elders that they may pray for him and anoint him with oil. And so we need to pray for each other. We should be a praying people. Uh, prayer shows our dependence upon God, uh, and, and it, it is something that we are to be doing regularly. Are there any, any comment on this? All right, 17, may the God of blank who raised our Lord Jesus from blank make you blank in every good work. May the God of peace who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead make you complete in every good work. Uh, verses 20, uh, beginning says, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul, in writing to the Philippians, says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then he says, For it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Paul, in the Philippians and Hebrew writer here, both say, you work out what God works in you. You let God work in you. You let God work through you. And then you will be able to do. And so, uh, you know, in Ephesians 2, in verse 10, it talks about the fact that we're created for good works in Christ Jesus. And we have this responsibility then to, to work out God's will in our lives and let God work through us. And uh, sometimes we want to do everything our own way but he says you need to, to work, work out these uh, in your own way. God is referred to as the God of peace. And so he, he's talked a lot about the sacrifice of Jesus in this book. He's talked about Jesus being the lamb a lot of times. But here he refers to him as the good shepherd. And he talks about the fact that he's raised from the dead. So it's, it's more than just... Uh, 
the sacrifice. He is our shepherd. He is raised from the dead. He is our first fruits from the, the, the dead. He also is our pioneer who blazed the trail in heaven because of his resurrection. Okay, we will, Lord willing, finish the true false next week and move into the review lesson. And I know Joel mentioned to you last week that there are two review lessons. I do not plan to do the second. I just plan to do the first one. The one that you get the new, from the New King James. Yes. Next Sunday we'll have the meetings. Next we have the meetings. Yeah. So scratch all that. Week after next, we will do that. Uh, and uh, next Sunday, we, our meeting begins uh, with Mitchell Dalrymple, at Dalrymple, and he will be here. And he will be doing the class session, doing the lesson during the class session. So let's plan to be back for that. And then week after next, we'll come back to the book of Hebrews. Thank you.
Morning. I'm going to start about one minute early before I start coughing again. I have a few announcements uh, concerning the congregation here. Uh, Jimmy Wade told me that Francis had had surgery on her leg this past week and it seemed to be doing well, and we're glad for that. I uh, got word this morning from uh, Donnie that uh, they took Brian back off the transplant list due to a, a small spike in uh, his temperature. They said it was nothing major, but it was enough to disqualify him uh, from the transplant list. And on that note, uh, I want to say a congratulations to Cole and Maddie Justice, which Maddie is Donna Linda, uh, and Linda's uh, granddaughter. Uh, they were married uh, yesterday in Springville, Alabama. And uh, since Brian couldn't be there, that it, it was able to be streamed to his room, so he seemed to be right there during, <clears throat> during the service, and we're thankful for that as well. Robert gave me this announcement that Diane's cousin, Regina Trulis, passed away Friday night and her funeral will be on Wednesday in Gardendale. And if I remember correctly, he said the burial will be here in Limestone County. Uh, our meeting starts next Sunday, and we hope that all of you can be here to run through Wednesday. Uh, and that's with Mitchell Dalrymple. And uh, Joel wanted me to emphasize that he had found out through talking to uh, Mitchell that his name is not Mitch, and we had got the word that uh, we would be calling him Mitch since most of us couldn't pronounce Dalrymple very well, but turns out his name is Mitchell, so if you call him Mitchell or Mitchell Dalrymple or, anyway, that's, uh, that's his name and uh, that's what uh, they wanted us to uh, address him as. Is there any other announcements that needs to be made at this time? If not, we'll turn the service over to Robert. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper, I'd like for us to Think about the fact that Jesus loves me. Of course, this is the name of a song that we sing a lot of times, and uh, we usually think of it as a children's song, and yet I think probably adults appreciate it more than the children do in reality. There's a couple of the verses in particular I'd like for us to look at. In verse 2, uh, a, the song says, Jesus loves me, he who died, Heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. And when we think about what Jesus has done for us, it's such a, a simple statement that he died for us. He died for our sins. And yet the import of that statement is beyond our ability to really imagine because he loves us so much that he was willing to give himself for our sin. And it is by his death, his burial, and his resurrection that he opens up the gate of heaven for us. Peter says that we have life in Jesus Christ and we have it abundantly. And so we have this abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom that's given for us. And so as we think about partaking of the Lord's Supper, we think about the love of Jesus and we think about how much he loves us enough that he was willing to die for us. And then in verse 4, because of what he has done for us, we sing, Jesus, take this heart of mine, make it pure, and holy or completely thine. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. It's not Jesus died for us, it's Jesus died for me. 
It's not we will live for him, it's I will live for him. And so as we think about partaking of the Lord's Supper, we remember the sacrifice that was made and we remember his death and his burial and his resurrection and we think about the fact that Jesus did in fact die for us individually and that we individually can have eternal life. In Romans chapter 5, beginning of verse 6, Paul writes, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You remember John said over in 1 John chapter 4, there in verses 9 and 10, he said, By this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And then verse 10 he says, In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is what true love really is, is that Jesus came and he loves us enough that he died for us. Going back to the book of Romans and continuing reading there in verse 9, he says, Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. The word exult is not a word that we use very often in our everyday vocabulary. And yet, the word itself means to show triumphant elation or jubilation. And literally in the Greek, it means to leap or jump for joy. One translation puts it to rejoice or to be openly happy about something. And so because of what Jesus has done for us, we rejoice. We rejoice. Because he has provided for our salvation. Paul, in writing to the Ephesians, says there in Ephesians chapter 2, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And then he says, but God. We were helpless, we were enemies, we were outside of Christ, we were lost. We were dead. But God. But God being rich in mercy. Because of his great love with which he loved us. And he loved us when we were dead in our transgressions and he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not as a result of works that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's sing the song number 810. Ryan, you sure should. We'll sing this song and after this we'll partake the Lord's Supper. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. If the ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me.
Thank you so much, Lord, for the love that you've shown to us. And we see it through your son's sacrifice for the love that you had for us to send him to this earth to live, live in this world yet without sin and to go to that cross to die for our sins. We thank you so much for that. And Father, as we take this time to remember that sacrifice and we're about to partake of this bread which represents that body, we do pray, Lord, that We'll all take our minds back to the cross and focus on, on that sacrifice. And we do pray that we'll take it in a manner that's pleasing unto you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you again giving you thanks for this cup, which to us Christians represents the blood that was shed at Calvary. And we pray that we will partake of this in a well-pleasing manner in your sight. And we're so thankful that you loved us enough to send your Son to die on the cross for our sins. And we pray that you will forgive us of our sins. And in your Son's most high and holy name, amen.
Gerald wanted me to make one additional announcement uh, that he forgot about earlier. Um, next Sunday, uh, the beginning of our meeting, uh, normally we would have a business meeting scheduled for that Sunday, and there will not be a me business meeting that day. So uh, let's, let's remember that. Our next song will be number 19 in the big book, number 19.
Christ said. Father, we're very thankful for this opportunity we have to meet here today. We pray, Father, that the prayers that we have petitioned to you already have been pleasing in your sight. We wait for your answer, whether it be yes or no, help us to accept it. Father, we pray that you be with Robert. He's about to present us a lesson, help him to be bold in his presentation, help him to teach us things that will help us to do better and be better in our everyday life. Thankful for the congregation that is here. Please bless us. Help us all to pay attention to what is being said. Pray that it is pleasing your sight and we can apply it to our everyday lives. Thankful that we was able to surround this table. We pray that our worship is pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Psalm 4, our lesson this morning will be number 732. Number 732. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the Spirit of life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our life. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and died in our ways. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. Revive us again, fill his heart with thy love. May his soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, by the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory, revive us again. Our song of invitation this morning will be the first two verses of Psalm 187. <coughs> Visitors, we're always glad to have visitors, and we're just so happy to have you with us. And uh, we also appreciate those that join us online. There's a number of people that do that regularly, and we do appreciate that. It's always good to be able to study with you in whatever means that we can do that. I'd like for us to begin by reading from the book of Luke in chapter 17, beginning in verse 11. It came about while he was talking about Jesus. While he's on the way to Jerusalem, 
He was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And it came about as they were going, they were cleansed. Now, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. As I read that passage, there's something that sort of stuck in my mind that really is not related to what we're going to be talking about this morning. But as I read that, one of the things that I thought about was that God judges people based on our hearts. I mean, this guy that came back, he was a Samaritan. He wasn't a Jew. He was a a Samaritan. These others, it implies, were all Jews. And so God judges based on our hearts and our actions show what's in our heart. But notice that just being religious, these Jewish people were supposed to be the people of God and they were supposed to have the right religion and they had everything all figured out. But none of them came back to say thank you to Jesus. And so just being religious is not the same thing as having a heart of faith. And so Jesus said to this Samaritan, you rise and go your way because your faith has made you well. I think it's a good lesson for us, and it's not necessarily, as I said, related to what we're going to be talking about this morning, but I just thought about it as I read it, and I thought, well, I'll bring that out first, and then we'll get to the lesson. We want to talk this morning about being thankful, and I think that as we read that, we see the importance of of being thankful, and one of the things about being thankful is that it shows our faith. It shows our trust in God. Whoa, we just went way, 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 way. There we go. Now, it says that one of them, he saw he'd been healed. He turned back. He's glorifying God with a loud voice and he fell at his feet, talking about the feet of Jesus, giving thanks to him. And he was the Samaritan. And so it was this guy who had faith. It was this guy who trusted in God. And so Jesus said, You go your way because your faith has made you well. And so it is by our faith our trust in God, we're going to be thankful. And so to be thankful then we must recognize that God is in control. If we're going to give thanks to God, we have to recognize the fact that He is the one that is in control and that we depend on Him. And as we recognize His control and we recognize that we depend on Him, we see His work being done. And we see His work being done in our lives and in those around us. And so in order for us to be thankful, we have to acknowledge that it is God's work, that it's God's power, and it's God's grace. And so if we recognize these things, then we have a basis for being thankful. That man who had leprosy, he knew that he wasn't healed on his own. It wasn't some kind of medicine that that healed him. It wasn't the doctor that healed him. It was simply Jesus spoke the word. And he did what Jesus told him. And his leprosy was gone. And so we see that it was a recognition of the power and an acknowledgement of God's power and His grace that was shown. Paul, in writing to the Thessalonians, tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning of verse 16, 
He says rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. In everything, give thanks. You know, there, there are things that happen to us and, and we wonder how can I be thankful for that and yet even some of the worst things that we, we think are the worst things that happen to us turn out to be one of the best things that ever happened in our lives. God knows how to work bad things for good. And so we need to be thankful in everything. Give thanks. Because this is what God wants us to do. In Philippians 4 and verses 4 through 7, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I'll say, Rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds, in Christ Jesus. And so as we think about being thankful and we think about what does it mean to be thankful, well, being thankful is the opposite of complaining or grumbling about things or complaining or grumbling about people. And sometimes we get in a rut if we're not careful and there are some people it seems by disposition just like to complain and just like to grumble. I used to have a guy that I worked with and one day he had said something about the job that he was on and he had some ideas for improvement and I went to the boss and I said, hey, so-and-so said, he said, what did he complain about today? He said, that's all he ever does, gripe and complain about everything. Well, he was pretty well true. That's about what he did. And so griping and complaining and grumbling, that's the opposite of giving thanks. Being thankful will result in a positive attitude and a positive outlook on everything. The more thankful we are for what we have and what God has done for us, the more positive our attitude and our outlook will be in life. But at the same time, complaining and grumbling will result in a negative attitude and a negative outlook on everything. And the more we focus on the good, the more good we're going to see. And the more we focus on the bad, the more bad we're going to see. And so we need to not complain and not grumble and, and so on. But our attitude and our outlook on life will determine if we look for what's wrong in people and we look for what's wrong in things that happen around us and events, whatever it is. And so we can decide for ourselves if we're going to look for the good or if we're going to look for what's bad. And if we look for what's good and right and all of the blessings that we have in our lives and we decide what we're going to look for. We, we can always look for something good in every situation. It doesn't matter what it is. And we can focus on the good and we can emphasize the good and we can think about the good instead of thinking about all of the things that are wrong. And I don't care who you are, or where you are, or what your circumstances are, there's always going to be something that is wrong. But you know what? There's going to always be something good too. There's going to always be something good. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Think about the good things. Think about the positive things. Focus on that which is right and good, not that which is wrong. And he says, if we do that, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they're beginning in verse 1. He says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all in the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and they ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink and they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. And he's talking about the children of Israel as they come out of the land of Egypt and their bondage and they go toward the land of Canaan. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased for they were laid low in the wilderness. Most of that generation of people died in the wilderness. And then Paul says, now these things happened as examples for us. That we should not crave evil things as they also crave. And do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. People sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. I want you to notice what Paul has said here. He said these people craved evil things and God punished them. He killed a bunch of them. They were idolaters. And a bunch of them died because of it. They acted immorally and he killed a bunch of them. And they tried and tested the Lord and he punished them repeatedly over and over and over. And so we have some pretty horrible things here that these people have been doing. And then notice the very next sentence, he says, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. You see, grumbling fits right in with all of this other stuff that we just looked at. And he says, as a result of that, they were destroyed by the destroyer. He said, now these things, and he repeats this because he's already said it, these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. Paul says, I've, I'm writing this down for you, and I'm repeating what's already been said that was written down for you so that you will understand the importance of not grumbling and not complaining, but being positive in your attitude." Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You see, we relegate grumbling and complaining as being some kind of something that doesn't really matter. It doesn't make any difference, but let me tell you, it does make a difference to God. And I'll admit right up front, I need this lesson as much as anybody sitting here today. Because it's so easy for us to fall in the habit of griping and complaining and grumbling and finding fault instead of being positive and always looking on the bright side of things. And so it's our attitude and it's our decision that determines if we look for what's wrong or if we look for what's good and what's right. And we look for all the blessings in our life. Now, I understand that sometimes people by temperament, just their natural temperament, the way they're born, are, are more upbeat than other people. And maybe they, they seem to just have a better disposition and some of us have to work on it more than others. I've got a brother, and a lot of you know my brother Henry. And he's always upbeat about everything. And he started teaching school this year. He's, he's very young to be teaching school. He just started at 76. And... So he's, he said he's going to be a school teacher. Well, he used to be, and he quit because he didn't like it, but he decided to go back into it. And I've had about a half a dozen people say, well, how does Henry like teaching school? And I said, well, I haven't talked to him, but I can promise you one thing, he loves it. Because <laughs> if he didn't, he wouldn't be there. And you know why? Because he's always up. He's the only person I've ever seen that had a heart attack and was excited to tell people about it because of all the, the new experience he had in life. He's just excited about everything. I'm not like that. We may be brothers, but I didn't get that part of it. And I have to work on it. And I have to think about my attitude and I think about my disposition. And, and if we're not naturally like that, then we need to work on it and we need to think about it and we need to learn to be content 
and be thankful for what we have in our lives. There's not a single person here this morning that has not been blessed abundantly, more than we can even name or imagine. And we need to be thankful for what God has done. And if we are thankful, truly thankful and grateful from our hearts, we're not going to complain and we're not going to be finding fault with everything. We're going to be thinking about how wonderful God is to us and what He's doing for us. Look what Paul said in Philippians 4, beginning in verse 12. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. You see, the Apostle Paul was Saul of Tarsus from, and he had come from, from Tarsus, he had come to Jerusalem, and he had attended school there under a guy named Gamaliel. Now, the closest thing that we can come to in this country, if we're going to think about that, would be if you decided you wanted to be a lawyer and you went to Harvard University. <laughs> I mean, that is the elite school to get you a law degree. And if you really wanted to be somebody special, you went to Jerusalem and you studied under one of the rabbis, and if you were really fortunate, you got Gamaliel because he was the top. And I'm going to tell you something. You had to have some connections. You had to have some money. You had to have some clout. And Paul, Saul of Tarsus, obviously had those things. He knew how to live in prosperity. He says, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. Both of having abundance and suffering need. How did he do that? How did he manage to to be content no matter what his circumstances. He said, because I can do all things through him that is Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't matter what happens to me. I put my faith and I put my trust in God. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus Christ. And Jesus has promised he will carry me through. He will take care of me. And so I will be thankful and I will be grateful and I will have a positive attitude about it because I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. We must learn to depend on Christ in everything. Complaining about other people is actually a form of passing judgment on them. James talks about this in James chapter 5, there in verses 9 and 10. He says, do not complain, brethren, against one another that you yourselves may not be judged. And he's basing this on the statement when Jesus said we're not to judge because if we do, we will be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door talking about God. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As we think about the suffering and the patience, this is suffering with patience is the opposite of being thankful. Or suffering with patience is showing that we are thankful and we are grateful. If we, if we suffer and we're not patient about it and we're not grateful about it, then this is not being thankful. One of the things about being thankful is that it removes worry, it removes anxiety, and it gives us joy, and it gives us peace. We cannot be thankful and be anxious at the same time. We can't be all troubled in our spirit and be thankful at the same time. It doesn't work that way. And so we need to learn to be thankful and be grateful because it gives us joy and it gives us peace. Look what Paul said. We already read this, but look at it again. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'll say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. He says, now if we do that, 
If we rejoice in the Lord always, if we are anxious for nothing, and we pray about everything with thanksgiving, he says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. In other words, it's more than we can even imagine or reason. The peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He will give us the peace that we long for. He will give us the peace that we want so desperately if we will put our faith in Him and we will trust Him and we will give thanks to Him for what we do have and be grateful for all the good things that happen to us in our lives. And then he says in verses 8 and 9, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. You see, if we put our faith and our trust in God and we really give Him thanks, and we're grateful for everything we have, good or bad, the God of peace will be with you. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, again, reading verses 16 through 18, he says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I want to go and look at Matthew chapter 6 and some things that Jesus said. Beginning of verse 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. And where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Jesus is saying here that what we need to do is we need to get our focus arranged not on this world, but get our focus arranged on heaven. Get our focus arranged on being with Him in eternity. And if we do that, and we have our eyes and our minds and our hearts fixed on Jesus, and on being with Him forever in eternity, then all the material things in this life are not going to really make a whole lot of difference to us. Because moths and rust destroy those things. Thieves break in and steal. Doesn't take long and they're all gone. If you drop down to verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. For either he'll hate one, love the other, he'll hold one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon means material things. And so he's still saying the same thing here. He's saying you can't put your trust in, in material things and put your trust in God at the same time. We can't do that. And then he says in verse... There we go. Verse 25. For this reason, that is since we can't put our trust in God and material things at the same time, for this reason, I say, do not be anxious. You see, the material things are going to go away. And material things may mean like possessions, or it may mean my physical health. Or it might be somebody that I love. Or it might be any number of things that's a part of this physical world. He says all of these things are going to go away. And he says since they are, don't be anxious for your life as to what you'll eat or what you'll drink or your body or what you put on is your life more, not more than clothing and the body is your, more, is your life not more than food and your body more than clothing look at the birds of the air for they do not sow neither do they reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not worth much more than they and which of you by being anxious can add a single cubit to his life's span 
if you really worry a lot, and it doesn't make any difference what you're worried about, if you really worry a lot, it's not going to help you live any longer. In fact, all of the medical experts will tell you that worrying will make you die sooner because it's not healthy. And I'm going to tell you something. I, I've done some pretty dumb things in my life. Uh, back several years ago, I was at work one day and I started having chest pains. And chest pains really got bad in my chest and then started going down my arm and it started going up my neck. And so being the kind of good person that I am, I thought, well, I need to figure out what this is and what's going on. So I went outside and ran around the block. My reasoning was, if it's my heart, I'll kick over dead. And if it's not, then maybe it'll go away. Maybe it's indigestion or something else. Well, when I got back, I was sort of greenish colored and sort of faint looking. And so my boss called an ambulance and called Diane, and she got there before the ambulance did. And they took me to the hospital for three days. And when they got through, they said, you know what's wrong with you? I said, what? He said, anxiety. <laughs> That's all it was. You see, it doesn't help us to worry. It just makes us sick. That's all it does. It's not going to help a thing. You can worry, 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 but it's not going to make anything any better. Why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil or spin. Yet I say that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the furnace, will he not much more do so for you Oh, men of little faith. It's all a matter of faith and trusting God. And realizing that God's got our back. He's got everything under control. He's going to do what's best for us. And you know what really is best for us? Is to leave this world to go live with Him. Ultimately, that's what's best for us. And if we keep that in the back of our head, it takes away a lot of the anxiety from a lot of other things. Do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow. For tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know what Jesus is saying there in, in, at the end of that chapter? Or end of that, that uh, statement there at that chapter? What Jesus is saying is, just take care of today. Do what you need to do today. Be thankful for what you have today. Put your faith in God today. And tomorrow's going to take care of itself. There's enough problems in today to take, keep you busy taking care of today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself because each day has enough trouble of its own. God's going to take care of it. Being thankful means that we count our blessings. It means we count physical blessings, we count material blessings. And physical blessings may be our physical bodies or it may be material things and possessions that we have. Whatever it is, we, we are thankful for what God has given us. And so we need to be thankful and we need to count our blessings. We need to count our blessings as far as relationships with other people. It is so wonderful to be able to have relationships, whether it's family or if it's friends or whoever it is, that we know we can depend on and we can have them as a part of our lives and they're going to help us to be better people. And we need to be thankful for the people that God puts in our lives. We need to be thankful for the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. And there's so many of them. We have forgiveness of our sins. And, and, and that in itself is, is more than we can even imagine what it really means. We have complete forgiveness of our sins. We have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with Jesus Christ. We have fellowship with other believers. Joel mentioned last Sunday as he was teaching the adult Bible class about 
the opportunity of going and, and visiting with other people in other places. And you go in a, a congregation, and this has happened to Diane and me so many times. We go in a congregation somewhere all across the country or somewhere else and not think that we know a single person there. And after we've been there for a few minutes, we find out that they know about a half a dozen people we know or we know people they know or, or somebody went to school with somebody or something else that, that knows each other. And you have all these relationships. And you know what? Even on the very, very few instances this has not happened, we still went away feeling like we were a part of them and they were a part of us because we're all in Jesus Christ. And we need to be thankful for that and what God has done. One of the things that I think it does us good occasionally is to look around and see all the problems of others. And especially those that are not in Christ, it's not limited to these. Even those that are in Christ still have problems. But if you look around you today and look at all the people that are faced with abject poverty, people that are in situations of abuse, people that are suffering from all kinds of addictions, and so many in our world that are living just completely aimlessly with no purpose in life, which is why suicide is one of the most common cause of death. Because people have no purpose in life. Then you look at the people that have sicknesses and disabilities and people that are homebound. And if you want to really see how blessed you are, go to the nursing home and visit for a little while. What about the people that are all alone? There was a lady, young girl actually, her name was Johnny Erickson Tata. She was 17 years old and she dove into a swimming pool that didn't have enough water in it. And she broke her neck. She was completely paralyzed. She's been a paraplegic now for 56 years living in a wheelchair. She has some days that she has excruciating pains. Some days she has minor pain, but every day she has pain. But you know what she did with her life? She started a ministry to provide wheelchairs for people that couldn't afford them. And she has raised money and donated thousands and thousands of wheelchairs to paraplegics all over the world, even many of the third country worlds. Not only that, she has spent most of her life teaching, encouraging, speaking, writing books, doing everything that she possibly can to get people to have a positive attitude and to look to God and recognize the blessings that we have. And if she can rejoice and she can see the blessings in her life, how in the world can we not in ours? No matter what happens to us. It just took off. I'm through anyway, so that's all right. This morning, if you're not in Christ, this morning, if you don't have Jesus as your Savior, then you need to come to Him and give Him your life and give Him your heart, and He'll take away your sins. He'll take away your worries so that you can actually rejoice in the Lord always you have peace in your heart and you can be thankful if you're here this morning you're subject to his invitation we invite you to come as we stand and sing
Uh, there'll be a, a, uh, after the meeting, the, uh, Sunday morning next week, there'll be a covered dish uh, uh, lunch. So <coughs> I think that was announced earlier, so just remember that. Closing song will be number 438, which in the first and last verse, uh, which was Steve Lovell will dismiss us in prayer. So I hope it's still time that we learn.